This is the Human Action Podcast with your hosts, Jeff Deist and Dr. Bob Murphy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. This is the Human Action Podcast. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Dr. Bob Murphy, and a very special guest this week. I'm excited about this show. It's a topic I've been thinking about. We're joined by our great friend, Professor Paul Gottfried, who is also, of course, the editor-in-chief of Chronicles Magazine. I asked him to come on the show to touch on a topic. I've been weighing how to present this. Uh, it, it's not particularly topical or timely, so I've been waiting until Christmas time. But I've wanted to expand upon something that's been, you know, bubbling up in my mind, which is basically the state of public intellectualism in America in 2022. And I think we can all agree that it's not a happy state. And I'll, guys, I'll open with this. And we go back and look at some of these debates between William F. Buckley and Gore Vidal back in the 70s and, and 80s. And look, both of those gentlemen have their own infirmities. But nonetheless, I mean, when we look back on that, that seems almost incredibly erudite in terms of public discourse or discussion relative to the garbage we see today, the garbage we endure on Twitter. So it seems like, at least from that perspective, that things are deteriorating. Yeah, I think you're right, Jeff. Another example would be, I don't know if you, if you guys watched it, but that show Crossfire that was on TV, and you know they had uh, hosts that were very knowledgeable, and it was, it was civil. Like it was, you know, they, they would clash and whatever, but it, it was definitely different from what you see now, certainly on Twitter, when, when both sides go at it. Yeah, I, I think... Um... Much of what we're seeing today may, may be a result of the dumbing down of the left. Um, I mean, the, the the right obviously is dumbed down even in comparison to what it was in the 1950s. But I, I think the, the, the left has shaped pretty much the dominant culture. Um, and opposition to the left, as I suggested before, um, is now determined um, by, one might say, moderateness or the willingness of people who are on the other side to pull their punches in many things uh, and to very carefully select those areas in which they think they're allowed to disagree. And uh, I, I think we see as, as a neutered, uh, a neutered right um, mm -hmm. and whatever in intellectual activity or energy can be found on this right goes on in think tanks such as your own um, which are separated from the conservative movement um, and for what has become the official opposition. Uh, Jeff was making a comment before about this, this uh, special, this dissenting university they're going to create in Houston. And you, you look there, it's like all the usual types, right? <laughs> the usual suspects are the ones who are invited, uh, which is to say people who are viewed probably as conservatives, but they're centrist and occasionally they lean left. Uh, and some of them are gay and therefore, you know, uh, acceptable to the LGBT crowd and so forth. Um, uh, the, the, the right is very careful. And as I've argued many times, it sort of engages in meticulous gatekeeping or fastidious gatekeeping against its own, uh, against its own right, intellectual right. So what you get, what you're always getting is a sort of neutered right uh, mm -hmm. that is allowed to function in opposition to what I think is an utterly dumbed down left. I mean, you know, even if you look at the Marxists and socialists uh, whom I had as teachers at Yale in the 1960s, they were much more intelligent than the people we're dealing with now who are concerned with removing pronouns or gender specific things uh, or legitimating sex change operations. And uh, so, I mean, th 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 this has become the opposition on the left. Um, and uh, the, the opposition which they permit to themselves or which, which develops as what's seen as an acceptable conservative opposition is, um, is anything but promising. Well, if we talk about this allegedly heterodox university being created, the University of Austin, I mean, first of all, they raised $100 million pretty easily, which suggests they're not all that heterodox. But if we go and look at their board of directors, some of their professors, the aforementioned Niall Ferguson's involved, Arthur Brooks from AEI, okay, um, Nadine Strassen from the ACLU, Jonathan Haidt, he seems to pop up every, Larry Summers is involved, I mean, Sobrab Amari, who's, you know, on this, on the right, but I guess the safe right, Caitlin Flanagan from the Atlantic, Tyler Cowen, no comment, uh, Andrew Sullivan, you know, I mean, this is just a who's who 
Uh, what passes for dissident or counter intellectualism today is basically uh, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Stanford. I mean, this this isn't heterodox thinking, and so it 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 harkens up Tom Wood's idea of the three by five card, <laughs> the of uh, uh, the index of allowable opinion, but. But beyond that, I mean, what what is intellectualism, public intellectualism? What's the role of it? I remember asking Amity Schles, the historian, and I like her. She's a Calvin Coolidge historian. I, I was asking her, you know, how does she define herself? Is she a writer, a journalist? Is she a public intellectual? And she really recoiled at that idea. Oh, no, no, you know, I'm I'm just a journalist. And so I wonder if there's such an anti-intellectual tenor in the United States today that people that we've almost lost the idea of what a public intellectual is and what their role is. No, I, I think, I think yeah, that's true. Um, and, you know, I never, I never heard of the term, by the way, public intellectual until about 20 years ago. Um, and considering <laughs> that my age, it was a long time to wait, you know, to encounter that term. Uh, and I sort of recoil from it because to me it means, you know, some, uh, some guy who appears on CNN, you know, and discusses a biography of Richard Nixon, um, you know, maybe some 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 contemporary version of Daniel Shore, um, uh, or somebody talks about the evils of McCarthyism or uh, 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 defends critical race theory. So, so the the word public intellectual for me has a very bad odor. <laughs> I, I prefer not to, not to use it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm very suspicious of people who identify themselves as public intellectuals. I think journalist is probably, you know, a more neutral term. Well, I've noticed what happens is that, like, even if we put aside, you know, like political er arena and just look even like at the hard sciences that who's, who are some public intellectuals right now, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, for sure. And besides him, I personally find him obnoxious. But it's that they get elevated and the public knows of them because of their one area of expertise. But then it's like, oh, and this guy's a scientist. And so he can pontificate mm -hmm. on all sorts of things where even if you thought they were well qualified in their area where they're you know known for, they can't be talking about the meaning of life or whatever just because you know astrophysics and you know, or or talking about man's role in, on on planet Earth because you're familiar with evolutionary biology theory. You know, it's not like Neil deGrasse Tyson has any special insight there. So um, that's what, I, what I've noticed is where people get a play, even like Stephen Hawking, who, you know, really did make some contributions in physics and, you know, his area. But then all of a sudden he's, he was like today's Einstein, you know, or when he was around. And, and that's what people look to him for. And he would pontificate on all sorts of things that by any stretch was not his area of expertise. But yet, oh, it's Stephen Hawking. So we got to listen to him. So that, that's how I've seen it, it get used. It's sort of Jeff that it's like, oh, this is an officially smart person. And so his views should get <laughs> elevated. Well, and we could put Sam Harris in that genre. He's a neuroscientist of some sort, but we you know why is he spouting off about politics? Uh, Steven Pinker. I mean, there's a lot of people. Uh, Jonathan Haidt. Haidt um, you know, people who who are scientists ostensibly. But um, one thing I think has changed is in the liberal arts of the humanities. And so, Paul, I want to ask you this. I mean, what what I when I think of an intellectual, you know, and think of a, of a PhD in academic, let's consider the late Ralph Fraco or the late Leland Yeager. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, these gentlemen spoke multiple languages. They translated in multiple languages. They could speak confidently, competently across several disciplines, history, economics, philosophy. The, you know, they may have a specialty and a PhD in a particular field, but they could speak competently across several and that seems to be lost at least from where i sit yeah i i think though in the case of ralph Rako, he held the wrong opinions to be a public intellectual right. I, I think there are ideological parameters you know that um are brought into play in defining what is a public uh, intellectual and presumably you're you know you're, you're going to be uh socially liberal um, and in favor of certain wars that the United States has fought to advance democracy against fascism, particularly, or German imperialism. Um, uh, somebody, for instance, who's, you know, said, you know, the Confederate, Confederacy really had a point about con their constitutional right to secede. You're not going to be a public intellectual if you hold that view. I think it's a perfectly defensible view, but you're not going to be a public intellectual. So, uh, somebody like Amari, uh, from compact passes for an intellectual, 
because he's all over the place. And on most issues that matter to the left, he's a leftist. He's for socialism. He's for, you know, government control of all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, he pretends he's like some kind of neo-medieval corporatist or some game like that. Uh, that. That, of course, is not an option right now. You know, the option is having more control by a leftist administrative state or less control if possible. So and then, then he you know, has conferences in which he invites, you know, leftist friends from New York. So this makes him a public intellectual, even if he holds eccentric views about uh, corporatism or, you know, converts to some kind of Latin mass Catholicism, that really doesn't matter much to the left. You know, this is a private eccentricity, but as long as you're sound on other things, right? Um, like civil rights, um, uh, fighting racism, um, and, you know, as long as you, uh, as long as you favor the present uh, social democratic dispensation, you know, we'll, we'll, let, it, we'll let you through. So, um, you know, that, that's why Omari passes for a political, an acceptable political reactionary. Well, yeah, Jeff, I can elaborate too on what you're saying there. Like even, you know, I know the economist the best, but like take Paul Krugman. So he's definitely, like, he's not as big now as he was say 10 years ago, but he certainly would be a public intellectual. Everyone knew he, oh, economics, and then he's gonna pontificate. And, you know, for people who are familiar with him, so like his, if you go back, someone like Paul Samuelson would have been, you know, the, the standard bearer of mm -hmm. Keynesianism. And there's a, a chasm between how learned the two of them were in terms of, you know, Paul Samuelson, don't get me wrong, he was super arrogant and everything, but like sort of justifiably so because he was really sharp and he read everything. He would talk about the history of economic thought, like Paul Samuelson published numerous papers on Bombavik, you know, and you know and this this sort of thing. People from the 1800s, and here's what their capital theory was like. Whereas uh, Krugman, when uh, Piketty's book came out, and people were arguing about the Cambridge capital controversy, Krugman number one got it wrong, like he was trying to restate it to his readers and messed it up. But number two said, you know, a lot of people are bringing up this this whole controversy that happened in the 60s. You don't even need to worry about it. Like he was telling his readers, don't bother reading the history of economics. It's not it's not worth your time. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying the difference in tenure, whereas Samuelson, of course, would say, ah, yes, I published eight papers in this field. Let me tell you about what happened back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remarkable. Well, in in the econ area, you know, we have Robert Reich. <laughs> uh, we have pe people like Noah Smith, uh, Tyler Cowen. Uh, Bob, who, who would you say are some of the best known public economist today. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So you're right. You had mentioned the ones you mentioned, uh, Larry Summers is up there and mm -hmm. he fits the pattern of what um, Dr. Gottfried's talking about where Summers, he will say things like, you know, it might be efficient to send waste to Africa, you know, like, like garbage to Africa. Because so it's a win-win, you know, we don't have yeah. room for it here and we can pay them enough and they're poorer than we are. And, and of course the left, when I was at NYU, there were like people writing in chalk, about, you know, get rid of Larry Summers on, you know, outside of NYU for some reason. So he's hated by certain people on the left. You know, his, he had very uh, controversial views about women in science. And that's what you know, he, had to, he had to give up his position. But yet in the grand scheme, Larry Summers obviously is not, you know, some challenge to the left. Mm -hmm. And yet so, so he's, a, he's a good example of the sort of pattern that Dr. Godfrey was talking about. Uh, and then you have like Stephanie Kelton you know, the, the MMT crowd coming in. And so there's a, there's a group of people that like them. And so again, it's sort of like what you were talking about, Jeb, that it, the, the, the standards of rigor have just gone out the window. And I guess it's what you're saying, Dr. Gottfried, about the dumbing down of the left where, you know, say what you will, Paul Samuelson was an economist, you know, even Krugman back in the day was, and it, it was an example of this. If you read Krugman's New York times columns, they drifted over time such that nowadays you wouldn't even know he was an economist. And I'm not saying that flippantly. I mean, I'm just saying that matter of factly that like his, when he wants to write about some government policy, you know, single payer healthcare or whatever it is, you, you would not even know that he was a trained economist. Like he just starts throwing things out with no acknowledgement of opportunity cost or anything like that, because he just knows this is what the crowd wants to hear. So um, I that's the sense in which even the, today's intellectuals associated with economics or Thomas Piketty is another one, you know, he's a big name, Oh, he's really, you know, oh, he's a, he's the master of inequality. And I'm just telling folks who haven't gotten into it, it's not merely that I disagree with his conclusions. His scholarship is terrible. Like his his book, I mean, I don't know if you, if you know this, Dr. Godfrey, but his Piketty's best-selling book, he went through and listed under U.S. administrations who raised the minimum wage and who didn't, and he got like four things just wrong. Like he he had it that 
only under Democratic presidents was the minimum wage raised in the U.S. and never under a Republican. And, uh, you know, you just go, well, no, that that's not right here. Just go look at the chronology. Like, I don't know what to say. So, I mean, it's amazing how much, you know, and Piketty doesn't know the first thing about the Cambridge capital controversy. He's got a book on capital theory and the way he said it, like Wikipedia's description is way more accurate than what this guy said in his book. So, and, and again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that like to be funny or, you know, pugilistic. I'm just stating as a matter of fact, like anybody who knows that area can read what he said. And so that's, you know, if an undergrad student wrote that, we would say, no, you got that question wrong. So it's just amazing. The people that it, it's more because they're real punchy and, you know, they have really extreme views. And that's now what catapults you to be the leader in that little area. Just like Robert Reich, who's just terrible on labor economics. Yeah, it, 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 it seems to me that, you know, if we're looking for official conservative economists who are also public intellectuals, there's three that come to mind. One of them is Larry Kudlow, who I think may have a master's degree in economics from somewhere. Um, and, you know, he's become a an advisor to Republicans. He's on Fox News. Right. I have no idea what kind of, you know, uh, formal economic theoretical expertise he has. I assume it's none. Um, he is, but he has, he has always trotted out as a serious economist. Um, another one is Stephen Moore, uh, who was associated with Cato Institute, which I suppose gives him a certain, um, uh, certain cachet. So he's also dragged on to Fox News and he spends it as one of America's leading economists, evidence of which I, I don't think can be found. Uh, the, 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 the most mystifying of the three, however, is Larry Summers. Um, whose name is must be mentioned. I mean, he has almost a kind of saintly status on Fox News. Um, and Larry Summers says that Obama, you know, not he was work for Obama, but but Biden is spending too much money on these uh, social programs. Larry Summers says this, and of course he also, as as Jeff mentioned, is invited to the University of Austin. Right, he's one of their um, uh, one 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 of their great eminences. Um, now, Larry Summers is no conservative of any kind. I mean, he worked in the Obama administration. He's always been a liberal Democrat, but he's a perfect example of what I call the Con Inc., conservatism incorporated intellectual. It is somebody on the left who spent 70 years on the left, but is breaking from the left on some issue, you know, on some small doctrine or interpretation of doctrine. There is your perfect conservative, right? You can't get any better. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. no one, you know, the left can't criticize you very much, and it's basically the left you're trying to conciliate, and they they they, they can criticize you because here's one of their guys, but he's really a conservative, um, and you know, as I always point out, the archetype uh, of, of this kind of conservative was Martin Luther King, um, who was on the far left politically, you know, and uh, was surrounded by communist advisors, but I, but you know. Uh, sometime in the late 1980s, reemerged as a conservative Christian theologian and political conservative, um, and because he made a certain he made a statement about everyone is going to get along in some future uh, uh, America, despite their race and long look at their skin color. Or so, so they quote a few lines from this. The same thing is true with Larry Summers. I mean, they found something that he said that represents the present. Uh, Fox News position. So this this makes him a conservative. Um, Murray Rothbard was not a conservative. Uh, Murray Rothbard was a uh, uh, an unmentionable reactionary, you know, who we're not going to allow. <laughs> His name will never be mentioned uh, any more than my name gets mentioned. Um, because, you know, we're, we're, we're not really acceptable to the moderates or not acceptable to the center left or, you know, whatever, whatever group they're trying to please by adopting this policy. But I, I've noticed in the case, Summers is an interesting case because, um, you know, he's being wined and dined in this by, by conservative groups. Another one is, uh, you mentioned was Haight or Haidt uh, from NYU, who is not any kind of conservative. He was a big supporter of Hillary Clinton. I, I, and he's still, as far as I know, a liberal Democrat. But again, he is willing to allow conservatives to express their views, their heterodox views, together with those of the left. So this makes him a good guy, you know, and you can invite him to conservative groups. I mean, this this goes on all the time. And I, I think I think it represents the utter gutlessness, you know, of what passes for a an authorized conservatism in the United States. 
Hey, hey, Jeff, I thought of one other one we should to be, to be somewhat fair. Thomas Sowell, uh, I think a lot of people would, you know, say who are public intellectual economists and he's, he's right, one. He mm-hmm. And uh, even there, it, it, he's an interesting case that, you know, I think it's like some of the normal tactics to contain them don't work because he's black and he's willing to like challenge affirmative action mm-hmm. policies and things. And so it's kind of hard for mm-hmm. a left wing white guy to call him a racist. And so like it's, he, he maybe like has a certain type of armor that uh, is an unusual case. But but yeah, so he's an example of of, of, of another economy, you know, that a guy that I like a lot um, as far as like you'd say, yeah, a public intellectual who's an economist. But but like Hayek, probably better known for his political writing than his econ. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, I wonder, though, it's not just the gutlessness, Paul. It's how vapid everything's become. In other words, <laughs> whether you want to call yourself a public intellectual or, or, or not, you know, in this day and age, if you want to feel like you're in the game, you're in the mix, you're part of the conversation, mm-hmm. which is, and, and this is just absolute catnip to academics. They, they need this like a fish needs water. So that... Uh, whether you like it or not, means today social media. And I just wonder if social media itself doesn't sort of degrade intellectualism just in, mm-hmm. in the sense of, of a medium, because you have to be combative, you have to be uh, a, a wise ass, you have to use you mm-hmm. know short, pithy, uh, you have to beat up on people with fewer followers. I mean, it's, it's not a good environment for real intellectualism. No, I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, but the, the people end up getting invited to the University of Austin, uh, or whatever they, they call this enterprise, um, are not the ones who, you know, who are uh, sort of clever or pugnacious uh, on social media. Uh, although someone like Douglas Murray, by the way, is. I think he's, well, he's one of the people they, they invited. Uh, somebody who has, by the way, absolutely no academic or scholarly credentials to speak of, but really is sort of the... Uh, you know, he's, he's sort of nasty, he comes at his enemies, and he also has the advantage of being an atheist and gay, you know, conservative. So that uh, gives him a certain a credibility with the left or the people they're trying to impress. Um, but uh, g- generally, generally, it's, it's the, uh, it's not, it's, it's the, you're right, there's a certain kind of vapidness about these people and an unwillingness to offend those they're afraid of. You know, I mean, uh, I'm thinking again of Murray Rothbard, you know, he'd fight with anybody, he didn't care. Ralph was, Rako was the same, you know, there was very pugnacious uh, 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 scholars and, you know, they, they like debate, they enjoy debate. These people don't enjoy debate. What they want is agreement, you know, with people like themselves who are equally vapid, you know, and they're, they're sort of sending a message to the right, but it's not a very daring message, you know, it's... Uh, the kind of message you send if you want to be a kind of minimal opposition and not give too much offense to the other side. Well, and I think there's a whole new genre of self-styled intellectuals who have grown up in this social media environment, come of age, become famous or infamous, Mm -hmm. who are precisely what you just described, giving this sort of effet opposition. I mean, I think a lot of these people's names we wouldn't know absent social media, people like Barry Weiss, people like Jordan Peterson, the aforementioned Sam Harris, Eric Weinstein, people like this, I think, are creatures of social media. Mm-hmm. No, you're right. You're right. There, there are Some of these people are creatures of social media. And another one I would, I would imagine would be Jonathan Haidt, you know, uh, and the Heterodox um, Project. So, so some of these people are. Others, uh, in the case of someone like Niall Ferguson, can always fall back on their academic appointments and that they've, you know, brought out books, uh, sort of popular histories of, uh, of certain subjects. So they're, they're okay. They're, they're, they're almost sort of a throwback to some, uh, someone like Gertrude Himmelfarb or some of the more academic neoconservatives of an, of an earlier period. But I think you're right about the younger ones. They really have broken their teeth. Uh, certainly Barry Weiss is a perfect, or Jordan Peterson, you know, would be the perfect examples. Well, let's talk more about the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. I don't know much about psychology. Uh, I think my son got his book, 12 Rules of Life or something, read it with his mom. Uh, But that maps of meaning stuff is is beyond me. As far as I can tell, he may be a very legit psychologist and a a real academic psychologist in terms of his, his past work. I'm not equipped to decipher it. But it sure seems like 
he's almost a silly person now. I, I really, I, I really dislike this Ben Shapiro level Daily Wire garbage. No, I, I, yeah, I, I could, fully, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Bob. <laughs> okay. You know, oh, thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, so disclosure, you know, Jordan Peterson had me on his show and, you know, and I, so I, and I was very glad to do that. So I want to disclose that. Um, yeah, just to give a little background. So, so my understanding, Jeff, that yes, he, he is very well published. I think he you know lectured at Harvard for a, a, a period. I'm not sure like what his rank was, their title was, um, in terms of like, looking at the big five and the impact and, you know, various studies about, oh, people with these personality traits, they tend to do such and such. And that literature, I think, you know, he has dozens of peer reviewed articles and that. So that's kind of like his area of expertise. And, and yes, I knew people who were into Jordan Peterson and his maps of meaning and how like his self authoring programs. And this mm-hmm. is, you know, he, he had personal clients in terms of counseling. And so he was like big in a certain little niche area. And I know people, that said, oh yeah, I was a fan of Jordan Peterson, and ever since this, you know, anti woke stuff, I I kind of wish he didn't get into that because now if I tell people I like him, they think I mean because of the pronoun stuff or whatever, and that's not why yeah. I like him. I like him for his old stuff. Like if you see his his he's got on YouTube some lectures he used to give in the classroom before he was famous. They're fascinating. Like like and it sounds goofy, but like he'll go through the movie Pinocchio and look at all the symbolism and all the things. And it's I know it might sound goofy, but it's actually like oh wow, I never thought of that. It's it's a really compelling lecture to just sit there and watch his lectures. Whereas, yeah, now it's, you know, he's yelling at, you know, some trans lady on, on Twitter or something and, or saying how he doesn't like fat girls. So, you know, it's not, there does seem to be two different guys. And he himself says that he periodically laments saying, Oh, Twitter's this hellscape and it makes me a bad person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he kind of is admitting Jeff, what you said that social media is taking people who were intellectuals, and then you know transforms them into something else, trying to you know please the uh, the angry masses. Yeah, I, I don't know that much about Jordan Peterson. I've, I read some of his work, um, you know, and uh, it seemed to be sort of decent quality. He's a he's a Jungian psychologist. I could see the Jungian uh, gestalt in his his writing. Uh, there also was a mystical side, uh, and more recently, I think he's become a, an evangelical Christian or something like that. Um, He's undergone some kind of religious transformation. He was a skeptic or an agnostic until recently. Um, and I, I'm sure one can find some depth in his writing, but I, I think what Jeff and I have also seen is this, uh, is this public intellectual personality, which, you know, is, as you're willing to concede, is not very impressive. And uh, when, I, when I see him interviewed by, uh, by part of the conservative, by members of the conservative club, um, I'm not exactly overwhelmed um, by by what by what I see. Um, it did take, I have to say, some courage to break uh, from his colleagues at the University of Toronto, uh, an, an institution that my late wife attended. Uh, and it, you know, it's um, uh, it's it's hard, it's hard, uh, you know, to go against the grain, uh, even if it's in a matter like you know insisting on gender differences. I mean, something which just you know, tell me it's axiomatic, but which has now been called into question. So I think that, and you know, that they, they did come down hard on him for taking what I think was a self-evident position. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, do, I do give him credit for that. Uh, there's no reason to assume, however, that somebody who does this is on the right. Uh, somebody who does this is, uh, is not mentally insane like the others who are mentally insane or actors if they're mentally insane. Well, now, insane. I mean, now we're told, of course, Glenn Greenwald and Matt Taibbi or far right, right, right. journalists, right. Well, very so. good, you know, going after these people and yeah. uh, much more effective, by the way, than Jordan Peterson when he speaks about politics. Well, could I get your thoughts, maybe both of you, on the late Christopher Hitchens? Was he legit? Legit in what? <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, a I, legit, I, 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 a legit I, intellectual. No, no. I mean, you know, he had he had a decent writing style. I'll I'll grant him that. Um, but I, I, I remember I remember his his attack on Pat Buchanan, um, and I did not agree entirely with Buchanan's history. I, you know, I, I thought he underestimated the, the danger of the Nazis and so forth. But uh, it was it was entirely right about World War One, uh, you know, which I think is so, sort of a non brainer that you know the uh, the Allies had as at least as much to do with it as the Central Powers, England probably more so than Germany. Uh, in my view, having studied this for the last 50 years and read lots and lots of scholarship on the war, 
from all sides. But uh, Hitchens went crazy that, and he dares to defend the Kaiser, which no, he did not defend the Kaiser. He simply said the Germans were no more to blame than the other side. And that, then it's, it's all of his prejudices come out. Um, uh, his hatred of God, his hatred of, he hates the Muslims because they, they believe in God. Mm -hmm. And this, um, uh, you know, there's something utterly sophomoric about a lot of his writing. Um, and, and the things about which he was supposedly good, like he favored, you know, some war or something, uh, didn't make me like him any, uh, any better. I thought intellectually he was very unimpressive. Um, and, you know, I, I take into account the fact that I disagree with just about every view he ever took. But uh, he, do, he does not defend his position very well. And there is an absolutely insufferable moral righteousness mm -hmm. uh, that, that suffuses just about everything he wrote. Yeah, I, um, I I don't I'm not that familiar with him, Jeff. But I I didn't like I saw him give a talk once about uh, you know it was it was something about it was it was a very atheistic one, and it was along the lines of I mean if I were God and I was going to get my message out, I would have done something more efficient than go to a bunch of illiterate shepherds and give them my word that way. It's like well, on the other hand, the Bible is the best selling book in human history, so it's not obvious that God screwed right, that one up. Right. You know what I mean? So th things like that. That yeah, it's more like college students, you know, passing around a bong and talking about the theism, as opposed to what you would think in terms of a, a high level debate. One thing I will say about him, I I, I did respect is he, um, he was a, he at first was making fun of waterboarding, like oh they pour some water. And then he had some Marines waterboard him, Ooh. and he wrote a column saying that's absolutely torture. I was wrong. Wow. So you know that did take him courage <laughs> wow. to admit that. And and he even said, and I knew they weren't going to kill me. I knew I just needed to like signal them, and they would stop. Right. And I was terrified. I lasted like twelve. Right. Seconds. Even knowing that, your brain take yeah. your hind brain takes mm -hmm. over. Uh, let me throw out another name for both of you, Charles Murray. Yeah, I've, I, I have read Charles Murray. Uh, I read the Bell Curve. Then I read some of his other works, um, and. Uh, you know, he's, he is, he does careful research um, as a journalist. I mean, you know, he's not, uh, again, an academic. He's basically a journalist who, uh, you know, is for a long time did interesting work on the IQ question. Uh, most of the stuff that he's written since then does not exactly grab me. Um, uh, you know, it's just like uh, the smartest people in history. Um, the... Uh, uh, the stuff that he did in the two cultures of America, you know, lo looking at um, Fishtown, Pennsylvania, and then Belmont, Massachusetts, um, I wrote a very critical review of. Um, uh, I think he exaggerates the soundness and uh, the rectitude uh, and the good parental model of the uh, uh, the people in Belmont, Massachusetts, the yuppies who, uh, you know, uh, uh, love um, Elizabeth Warren and other such politicians. Um, they're they're not the conservatives that he believes that they are. But um, uh, he, he's okay. I mean, his uh, as I, I I really think that for all of its problems, the Bell Curve may be the best thing that he wrote, uh, and that was written with a collaborator, Richard Herrenstein, who was a professor at. Well, Harvard. I I would say that the average uh, Twitter person would consider Charles Murray an intellectual. I think. Maybe we're looking at him a little differently from a more a pure academic or PhD perspective when you call right. him a journalist. I don't think most people think of Charles Murray as a journalist. They think of him as a social scientist or researcher. No, I think you're right. Um, but, it, but you know, he, he, is, he is a journalist who sort of improved his game um, and was able to use, I think, scholarship uh, produced by other research produced by other people very effectively. Yeah, I would. I mean, all I'm really familiar with is the bell curve, you know, in terms of what have I sat down and read from him, Jeff. And yeah, I agree with what Dr. Gottfried's saying. It was I mean, it's funny. Sometimes the the journalists who have a certain beat know that area better than the academics, you mm -hmm. know, because they actually have to read multiple sources and they still have this vestige of accountability and like fact checking, which a lot of academics don't. But mm -hmm. um, so and, you know, just it, it is courageous. Like he went into that knowing full well this is going to close a lot of doors for me. You know, like it just, people are going to automatically, you know, say all sorts of horrible things about me just because I'm even entertaining some of these ideas. So I suppose, you know, you could tip your hat in, in that respect, but yeah, as we've been saying, kind of the theme of this episode so far, it seems is the people nowadays that are considered public intellectuals really, I mean, if you just think back to like Hayek and Keynes and when they would grapple with stuff, like just how much the, there's an interview with Hayek one time when they're asking him about his opinion of Keynes and one of the things he says is, oh, he only read the uh, in English. 
you know, in terms of <laughs> so like 99 percent of economists in the United States right now would be disqualified under that criteria, right. including me, <laughs> that, you know, he was saying, oh, what he read in German, he said he only knew if he already understood the material, you know, and that's, that's well, high ex- uh, well, judgment. I mean, let me put you on the spot. Let me ask both of you to name, name someone who you think is a real intellectual. They may be unknown. I, I think there are real intellectuals in America today. I think many of them are still in universities. I think they tend to be older. Uh, but it, it, if I have to, you know, in, b- based on your own criteria, g- give me the name of someone you consider a real intellectual as opposed to what appears to be a pseudo intellectual class that's clamoring on Twitter all day. And they have to be alive <laughs> <laughs> or, yes. or, or a reasonably warm body. You, you go first, Dr. Gottfried. I got to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just a name that popped into my mind. He writes for Chronicles, uh, and and there, there, I, you know, there's probably at least a dozen people who would who would qualify by the standards that uh, that Jeff has has given us. Um, and that's Sean McMeekin, um, who writes very daring, daring, well researched history in Russian. Uh, uh, Russian. He wrote, wrote a book, uh, Stalin's War, which I thought was an excellent. Uh, work and he reads about twenty languages, in, um, including Russian and Turkish. Um, <clears throat> so I, you know, I and he's a young, relatively young man. I, I, I correspond. I haven't met him. I would guess he's probably in his late forties by now. Um, he certainly would qualify, you know, as as a serious scholar. Um, I, another person is Stanley Payne, uh, who is even older than I am, but you know, is I think the outstanding historian on fascism and the Spanish Civil War. So there, I've given you two names. <laughs> uh, boy, it's it's true. I'm trying to think of like I don't want to just like say my people I know. Per like, I, I like like a Daniel McCarthy is is as somebody. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I, I'm thinking like David Gordon. Like I said, I'm trying to think of people, Jeff. That's not obvious. Like, well, mm-hmm. those are just your buddies. Uh, I, I may have just to think, why don't you continue the conversation? I, it's I'm sort of blanking because you put me on the spot. Well, it's, it's I'm embarrassing because I'm thinking of people and they're all dead. So, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, they're very good economists that are attached to the Mises Institute. I hear some of them mm-hmm. speak, you know, and, and they seem to be very, very knowledgeable in their field. I mean, someone like Joe Salerno, I'm just picking, you know, one person, but uh, there, there are many of them. Well, um, I, I, they're, would, they're, they're, I would I uh, would I would offer up the late Paul Cantor. As someone now, he was in yeah, the, he yeah. was in the liberal arts field. He was an English professor, but nonetheless knowledgeable, very serious scholar, very exceedingly well read, and had written voluminously on a bunch of subjects on a more popular level. But in his field, had written a lot of published material, um, and it it just feels like the incentives in whether in academia or think tankdom. We're no longer set up that way, so the world is just not going to produce Paul Cantors amongst the 20 and 30-somethings because there's no incentive to be Paul Cantor. There's an incentive to be Barry Weiss. Yeah, certainly if we're dealing with social media, there is. And also, if you want somebody who could sort of build bridges to the left, then I think that's what you know these people are doing, are trying usually to advance their own careers. Um, you know, Paul Cantor would not be very useful to you, nor would Stanley Payne or... Any, any of these other names that we're throwing out. So, I, you know, I, I, I think they're engaged in a very different enterprise from what these mm-hmm. traditional scholars um, were trying to do. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, th- 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 that's, that's why they have succeeded. Um, the people we've, uh, we've mentioned, these sort of pseudo-intellectuals, why they do so well, why Barry Weiss, you know, has done much better than Paul Cantor in terms of you know, attracting media attention. And that's what they mm-hmm. want to do. They want to attract media attention. I think that that's a sine qua known, you know, for their their professional development. I think just because it's relevant, let me just throw out a name. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. Uh, James Lindsay. So he is, I think his PhD is in math. Mm-hmm. It's either math or physics. It's, you know, it's a very hard science. And then he was involved, If in case you don't know who he is, uh, Dr. Godfrey, he was the guy in the, the, the hoax where like three people... They published all these papers like like they went to a dog park and kept track of how often one dog would rape another. And they sent it to like some feminist journal and they did it. And it was all bogus. Like they just made right. stuff up. I remember and, that. and they published yeah several, mm-hmm. you know, our, and so he basically just took a year off and just became an expert in all this stuff. And now he's published like encyclopedias on, on wokeism and things like that. 
but he's a good example on Twitter. Um, I think he was banned and then recently reintroduced because of Elon Musk because he called someone a groomer and so he got kicked off, you know. But he like he literally does mom jokes, you know, like if someone's coming at him, he'll say, "Yeah, well, your mother." And so it's like there's two different guys, and then when he's on and when he's on podcasts with the right crowd, he's extremely erudite. If you go and listen to his own podcast, he'll sit there and delve into, you know, the, the '60s radical movement and Foucault and all this stuff, and he he's read everything in these areas and he absorbs it. He's extremely intelligent, but yet his public persona on Twitter is, you know, some, some sophomore in high school making fun of somebody's mom. And I, I think you, you just hit on why it's because, you know, I think they realize at some level I have to get attention and this is, and also, you know, he, he's defended it. He said, well, I think it's funny. It's my, my childish sense of humor. And if you're not going to listen to my academic work because of what I say on Twitter, then you're probably not going to like me anyway. So no harm, you know, I, I disagree with his judgment, but that's how he justifies what he does. But so there, I think there's lots of people like that where they really are academically sound and, and smart people, but yet for some reason, you know, on social, and I, you know, I probably am not the uh, the most erudite looking person in terms of my Twitter account too. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, condemning. I'm just saying. This well, is when you how say it plays out. when you say for some reason, the reason mm -hmm. is clown world. That's the reason. Right. Right. Yeah. Sure. And well, you know, there there is somebody like uh, Jay Bhattacharya, uh, who I, I see on Fox. He's a uh, professor of, of medicine at Stanford, and uh, he's a man who, you know, who's, who seems to be a very sound scientist. Um, he's held his ground against the um, the COVID hysteria. Uh, he's fought back against it. Um, he's, he's a true gentleman. Um, I, you know, it's uh, I would hold him up, so I want to say, as, as a public intellectual, if you want to use that off the term, uh, whom we can admire. And I, I think we probably can find other people in medicine and the hard sciences much more easily than the liberal arts, you know, right. who, would, uh, who would fit the description. And I think that just shows the bias here amongst the three of us. When we talk about intellectuals, we are generally thinking more of people in the humanities and the social sciences right. and the literary arts in those fields. But no, undoubtedly, there are to toiling away in obscurity, thousands upon thousands of brilliant uh, mm -hmm. STEM uh, researchers and, right. and academics across the country. And God bless them, because hopefully they can save us from ourselves. But I think we got to end it on that note. Um, it's it's a great topic. Uh, will social media drive intellectualism into the ground? Well, I guess it's up to us as consumers and uh, to resist that. So I want to thank Paul Gottfried for his time. Go to chroniclesmagazine.com. I'm a subscriber. Full disclosure, love the magazine, uh, love what they're doing, really enjoy their cultural takes. And of course, be sure to follow Dr. Murphy on Twitter at Bob Murphy Econ. And we will see all of you next week for a Christmas show. So stay with us. Thanks for joining the Human Action Podcast. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. And in the meantime, you can find more content like this at Mises.org.